Roger de Flore is a fascinating character in mid-12th century history. In fact, it's possible that two of the biggest false history claims associated with the Knights Templar can be explained by the exploits of this man. Roger de Flore was born the son of the falconer of Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, whom we discussed in relation to his Grail Castle, Castel del Monte, in our last video. Though Roger de Flore has this association with Frederick II, he was born 17 years after Frederick had passed. Roger grew up in Brindisi, Italy, where the Knights Templar had a busy port and a shipbuilding interest. As a child, he would often speak with the sailors there. Eventually, he became a Knights Templar sergeant himself and came to command one of the fastest ships the Templars owned, named the Falcon or Falconi. As the Knights Templar fortunes changed near the end of the Crusader era, so did those of Roger de Flore. Roger and his ship, the Falcon, were present at the final fall of the Latin Kingdom stronghold of Acre in 1290. It was this final part of Templar and Crusader history that changed the destiny of Roger de Flore, as well as the Knights Templar. Roger was accused of only rescuing those from Auker that could afford a high price for a place on his ship, as thousands scrambled to escape the city at that time. He was also accused of not sharing these funds with the Order. As a result of this, Roger was essentially excommunicated from the Knights Templar for good. As a result, Roger turned a wealthy interest in Genoa to get his own ship and turn to piracy for about a 10 year span of time. It's at this time that Roger likely became associated with the skull and crossbones design of what would later be termed a pirate's flag or the Jolly Roger. I speculate that Roger de Flore is the real reason that design came to be associated with piracy. Given this, we do know that the so-called Skull and Bones design, or Jolly Roger, had been in existence for hundreds of years prior going back to the Greek culture that valued this as a form of memento mori, or remembrance of the dead, in a way that also reminds us of our mortality. This concept would also later come to be valued by Freemasons in their own way. Given that, it is clear that a very similar value had been in existence in antiquity prior to the information and disputes the notion that the Knights Templar or Freemasons were the first to use the skull and crossbones design because it had been a memento mori or a concept involving contemplation of one's own mortality for centuries prior to that. simply may have been that Roger de Flore was the first to use the death's head cult design as part of his activities as a pirate. Despite this, many later people have attempted to connect the origins of the skull and bones or Jolly Roger design to the Knights Templar. 
In fact, this association with Roger de Fleur seems to explain why this false notion is believed by many even today. Here we see that the, quote, Templar involved was a disgraced brother of the order who had turned to piracy as a result of having been banned or kicked out of the Knights Templar. Later in history, the fact that many people speculate pirates were part of a Freemasonic faction can be explained via the reasoning that many well-known pirates, such as Blackbeard, were also well-known Jacobites. Jacobites were followers of the fallen Stuart kings of England, Ireland, and Scotland. This faction in exile had formed a type of Freemasonry designed in part to aid them as an intelligence organization in their efforts to regain their crowns. The Jacobites are, in fact, the very first Freemasons to associate their organization with that of the famous Order of Knights Templar. This was done via the oration of the Chevalier Ramsay in about 1747. Prior to that, there is no stated rationale that associates the military orders of the Crusades with Freemasonry at all. In fact, it's a historical fairy tale that there is any link at all between the Knights Templar and Freemasons beyond the more modern veneration and admiration of the Knights Templar on the part of Freemasons. In fact, there have been many attempts over a long span of time related to those who have presented fake documents and other bogus means in an attempt to prove this association. Famous Masonic historian Albert Mackey exposes all of this in his famous book, The History of Freemasonry, Its Legendary Origins. About 1303, Roger de Flore developed what would come to be known of as the Catalan Company, thus also possibly explaining one of the other greatest falsehoods associated with the story of the demise of the Knights Templar. After some years as a pirate, de Flore, in a way, went straight and formed a company comprised of mercenaries and a navy for hire. At this time, Roger even became a Baron of Malta. This is long before that island became associated with the Knights of St. John. In the later 13th and early 14th centuries, Malta was a place that pirates and privateers would frequent. Speculation by this author involves the fact that some, if not all, of the so-called Templar fleet at La Rochelle may have simply gone over to be part of the Catalan Company after the persecution of the order in 1307. Roger likely still had some connections in the Knights Templar at that time and may have been able to persuade many of the ship's captains to ally themselves with him with promises of plunder and high pay. This in comparison to membership in an organization like the Knights Templar where there is no pay or plunder, at least on paper. This could also explain where many of the former Templars went after the demise of the order. Mercenaries are paid well, while becoming part of another military order may not have been as attractive to former Knights Templar at that time. Thanks for joining me for this brief look at Roger de Flore and his possible impact on some of the myths and legends of the Knights Templar. And uh, look forward to another video coming soon about the Chevalier Ramsey and how the Knights Templar came to be associated with Freemasons 
as well we'll be looking at some of the myths and legends of the original medieval stonemasons guilds in comparison to the legends and myths now valued by freemasons which are significantly different so stay tuned for more and we'll talk to you soon thank you